I don't know. We're going to see where the whole thing goes. So anyway. He's going to play the guitar solo on Sultans. I certainly am. That's it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Anderton's TV, where today <laughs> my special guest is... Um, where shall we start? I mean, founding member of Dire Straits, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, multi-Grammy award winner, artist, chain of pubs, travelled man, and to top it all now, a guest on Anderton's TV, the pinnacle of every musician's career. Obviously. Quite right. So, John Ilsley, welcome to Anderson's TV. Thank you very much. It's um, a very auspicious uh, introduction. <laughs> I'll have to try and live up to that now. We have um, just had a lovely hour together in the pub next door. Uh, well, was I the only one drinking? You were the only one drinking. Did you notice yeah. that, did you? Yeah, that's, I'm so, a musician, you see, and you, you make musicians happy by but, selling them the guitars. This is, this is what it is. I, <laughs> I st I'm trying to stay professional. And I... Uh, and, we had a fascinating conversation that I'm hoping we can try and recapture on camera for you now. But, John, um, I think, as with all these kind of interviews, a lovely way for people to sort of get to know you will be to try and go back to your formative years um, of what it was about the music scene as you were growing up that, that made you want to start playing a, a, an instrument and eventually, you know, sort of forge a path into music. Well, I suppose in a nutshell, I, I was fortunate to be born um, in 1949, which meant that by the early 60s, I was being bombarded by the Beatles, the Stones, the Kinks, the yeah. Who, um, uh, Chuck Berry, Elvis Presley. I mean, I was in a very, very spoilt arena yeah. of music, uh, saturated with this incredible energy. And I think that's what made me want to, um, in some way, um, join it or, or enjoy it, to start off with. Join it and enjoy it. So um, uh, that was the inspiration to actually picking up the guitar, was, was that energy in the early 60s which we were immersed in. You couldn't ignore it. No. I mean, everybody talks about the swinging 60s. I mean, I, to me, my, that was the swinging 60s was OK, that's fine, but it was the music that was speaking yeah. to me. Yeah, and that then, did you have a musical family or, you know? No, I, I, I didn't. I came from a very um, uh, straightforward Leicestershire, <laughs> middle class, you know, family. My father was a bank manager. Uh, you, you know, I think all he knew about was Vera Lynn, maybe, because he'd just got back from the war. Yeah. And so I grew up in, in a household which was really a... <sighs> what can you call it, it was a safe place because they wanted to make it safe. They'd been yeah. through five years of war, my, my parents, yeah. and they had four children and I was the last one. Um, and uh, they wanted to make life as safe as possible. So they created this world of um, predictability, if you mm. like. And then the Rolling Stones came into view and that <laughs> changed everything, of course. Um, so they were quite... Um, Perturbed, I suppose, is a gentle word for putting it, when I picked up a guitar and started to uh, try and uh, immerse myself in something different from what they imagined I was going to do in life. Uh, yeah, it's interesting you, you say that, because I think that generation, there was such a sea change in, in music. You know, my, my grandfather, same, you know, Vera Lynn, um, uh, all the big band swing stuff. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And so yeah. when Dad was like, you know, came home with the big hairdos and the winkle pickers and want to be in a pop band. Whoa. Yeah, there was, there yeah. was a, quite a sense of, no, you're not going to do that. Um, they were frightened. Yeah. They, they were frightened about the changes that were happening. And, you know, the Rolling Stones really represented something kind of dangerous to yeah. our parents. And they, For sure. You know, and um, they were probably right, actually. Um, <laughs> but uh, at the time, we all wanted to, you know, uh, immerse ourselves in that in that sort of energy. And, and for the simple reason that when you're growing up and as a teenager, this is of course, as we know, the most influential time for all of us with yeah. music. Yeah. That's when we form our early notions yeah. of how we immerse ourselves in that world. That was why I was so excited when I found out that we might get the chance to interview you because that whole... Because I'm older you know, than you, you mean. Well, no, I mean, what I mean is <laughs> Dire Straits was like the Beatles for me. 
you know, or the Rolling Stones. That, that, that I can think of half a dozen uh, bands of that, you know, and I've, I've always said this, I think, you know, whatever music is there in that 14, 15, 16 yeah. years old, Very important. that shapes your whole life yeah. forever, you know, yeah. so. Um, oh, can you imagine hearing Elvis for the first oh, time? And that's, that's all right, Mama. That's the one thing I, mean, I kind of know. go, if I had a time machine and I, or like, what did, I wouldn't want to go back that far. Or maybe I'd go back and see dinosaurs, but actually out of everything else, what I really, really wanted to see was just Elvis or Hendrix. I know it's a slight different gap, but those real, like you'd never seen this before. You'd never seen a, a Hendrix yeah. or an Elvis or, you know, or a Beatles or a Stones. And I don't think people have, I'm not sure that anything, I mean, again, maybe, Maybe something like the Sex Pistols again. Did was that a like we've never seen this before? They were the know. first boy band, you know that, don't you? Well, I think there's probably a lot to be said that there's maybe <laughs> slightly more manufactured than they'd like you to think. But um, I don't know what in my, what did I what what would you see now if you were a, a young teenager? What would you see now that truly musically no one's seen before? I'm well, not... that is a difficult thing to say. Funny enough, I was watching the TV last night because they'd had the thing on Stormzy doing the 2019. Um, yeah. And uh, I saw it actually, I wasn't there, but I saw it on the TV the first time. Yeah. And I, I don't really get it because it's not really my thing. But I watched a bit of it last night and I watched it a bit more intently. And actually, he is very interesting how he's incorporated a lot of different things into his world. Yeah. And it's not just, you know, the, the obvious sort of rapping kind of thing. So he's, I think yeah. he's, he's, he's actually... Im integrating a lot of things that are very important because you yeah. can't be a rapper all your life. You've got to actually acknowledge everything else that's going on around you. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's... it's uh, you say Hendrix is a one... Oh, yes, of course he was a one-off because never had happened before. Yeah. And uh, the first time I ever saw him was... was uh, he was third on the bill. Uh, the Walker brothers were headlining. The right. Tremolos were number two and <laughs> Hendrix was number three. <laughs> And it was at the Nobody's Worc talking about the Walker Brothers anymore, are they? Apologies if you are in the Walker Brothers. Um, and this I was at the Worcestershire well. Gaumont, I think, a, a, a <laughs> cinema in, in, uh, in, in Worcestershire. Oh, and man. he still set fire to his guitar. He did two songs and he set fire to his guitar on one of them, yeah. And we were just looking at the going, what is going on here? Nobody, because nobody knew him. Nobody knew what. And then, of course, it, it just all happened. So your point is, is very valid. And in, in fact, it, I think it's getting increasingly more difficult to, to be uh, uh, unique, if you mm. like. But then Billie Eilish comes along, you see, changes the whole thing again. And, I mean, in some ways, Ed Sheeran, you know, a busker off the street, mm. uh, he comes along and even breaks the straights record in a, a, a sellout shows in Australia, which is most offensive. <laughs> You know, he did one more show than us, I think, just to and make a point. didn't have to split the money, you know, no. five ways either. I mean, it's just no. like... just him and his manager. I mean, that's real money. Oh. But anyway, <laughs> I mean, I, but the point is, you know, I think if you're courageous enough, and we, we talked about this earlier, if you're courageous enough to follow your instincts, there's a possibility mm. that you might do something unique. Because, in a sense, as human beings, we're always ready to be surprised mm. by something new. And I think that when the straight started, just to go back to the, your excitement about the band, which I'm very glad to hear about, um, you know, we came out right in the middle of the punk thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the Sex Pistols, the Clash, and God knows, sort of slaughtering the dogs, and God knows else what was going on. Everybody was sort of hating everything, you know, and suddenly we were singing about a jazz band in South London, you know, the Sultans of Swing, which we're going to play later, and you're going to play the guitar. And... Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm ready for anything. Wait, can you? I'm ready for anything. And, um, so that came along, and so and so in a sense, it it sat there in the middle of all this other stuff going on. And I often wonder if it had come out five years later or ten years later, whether it would have stood out so much because yeah. it was in a sense it had its own, the Straits had its own sort of style. Yeah. It wasn't compromising with anybody else's. It was literally on its own in that particular time and so it did stand out yeah but not many people were prepared to actually invest in it because everybody wanted punk bands and how much they hated the world and their mothers and fathers and their sisters and brothers and god knows what else and that lasted actually the punk thing lasted for a, 
a, a very short period of time, but it was yeah. very important. There's always to I shift think, things around at that moment. I think there's always been a cycle with music, and it was really in, you know. So at the beginning of the as you say, end of the seventies, beginning of the eighties, I think there was the, the the punk scene was a was a rebellion, and then I kind of feel like through the eighties, music became. Um, more difficult to participate in as, you know, virtuoso musicians and guitar players. You know, I think, you know, Mark would have set the bar at a certain level and then you had Eddie Van Halen and, and you know, and it sort of felt like it was getting more complex and more produced and everything. And then there's a backlash again at the end of that as you go into the 90s, whether it's grunge or Britpop or whatever that just goes, no, 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 strip Oasis, it all right back Oasis again. And like, yeah, 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 you so know, strip more, more to, guitar or into, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and I, I kind of feel it's like um, there is a sort of a reset button. Actually, I, maybe then there was, because I think maybe we all consumed music through a mainstream, so everybody's consuming the same music all the time, whereas now... Are you talking about, well, well you're doing that now. Do you, th- do you think? Yeah, I, I think the music business and the, and the, and the, the people who actually selling the music to the public, the radio stations are all guilty of this too, mm. is that they've made it so homogenised mm. uh, that, you know, that you're, not, you're not getting to hear stuff that is maybe on the outskirts, which people could be interested in. They're not allowing it in because they want to play it safe. They want to, they want to sell product. Mm. The music business, is in fact, actually uh, has, has sort of, in a sense, put a bit of a break, I think, on creativity. Right. You might debate. I, I mean, it's an interesting question. Would you agree? I, I think there's... Um, I think now... I feel now as a listener, I've got more access to more music than I've ever had before. And I rather like the... We talked a lot about algorithms, didn't we, over lunch? We and just sort of, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the power of Facebook and Amazon and all that kind of stuff. But I, I rather like that I can start to listen to music that I like and then have suggested for me by the algorithm other music that other people might like. So okay. I, I think I've discovered more music, re, you know, over the last five years than maybe I did when all I would ever listen to was Top of the Pops. Is that because you're going back? I mean, the point I'm making is that... Oh, you mean new... Yeah, new, I'm yes. I'm talking about, you know... The niche music which is played on the radio pretty yes. much 24 hours a day now, which everybody... Oh you know, is listening to. And that, that is literally infecting, pe- infecting people, uh, adjusting people's minds yes. to what is, what is music. Yes. So you're, you and I are interested in, in looking and experiencing different kinds. So we do go and search. Mm. And it, you're right, on, it's all there. Yeah. But, and also I would, I would make the point that there's an awful lot of people out there who see music as a, quite a small part of their lives. We, for us, it's a big part. Mm. Because that's we have a, we we love it, you know, for all sorts of different yeah. reasons. Uh, but for a lot of people, it's a small thing. It's not, you know, they go and dance to you know, chirky chirky cheap cheap or thing or, or or some other thing, you know, in in a party. And oh, this is great music, and they're going, yeah, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and so you know, so they're not really listening in a yeah. sense because they're they they've been pushed down this road, which is, you know. It's business run. And yeah. I remember very clearly, just to make a point, we were doing making movies in, in the power station in New York. And um, forget the name of the guy now, I should remember. Anyway, he was the CEO of uh, Phonogram worldwide, you know, in Europe. Mm. And he came and took take us out for supper. And he was a very nice man. He was a Dutchman, actually. And, um, uh, you know, he was chatting away and listening to the music and really interested in what we were doing with Romeo and Juliet and Ton of Love, obviously, because this was quite a seminal album for us. So we were doing quite a bit of experimentation and, and, and what have you. And he was very, very excited. And he said, you know, sadly, I'm, I'm not going to be around for this because the business is changing and I'm being moved sideways because they don't want music people, it seems, at the top of the tree. Right. They want... Money men. Yeah, business. And the money yeah. men are moving in to the music business because they can see mm. some serious money to be made here. And that, to me, was the big change in the early ni- in 1980 when that happened. Mm. So it was quite early on, really. And, 
you have to fight your corner. I mean, you know, every time we put an album out, you know, Love of the Gold, after, you know, that everybody's going, oh my God, there's no single on this. Well, you know, it went to number one in 15 countries. So you, what do you know about music? You know, and so you've, you're constantly fighting the business all the time. You yeah, know. that, I mean, that I think is, is a great shame of modern music. When I, when I was, you know, growing up, um, I would take my paper round money to the record shop on a Saturday and I might be able to afford one or two albums like that. So Didn't I, change for me either. Yeah, it was the same thing. Yeah, so you, not only do you perhaps take a little bit more thought and consideration into which album I'm going to buy, yeah. you also listen to all 10 songs or however many songs are on the album and you'd listen to it in an order and I still, I still can't decide now whether or not... I, th- I think there's, a, the, there's part of me that enjoys now flipping the vinyl over and then there's the other part of me that when CDs came along going, this is great, I haven't got to stop and turn the album over <laughs> halfway through. But I do think now it's too easy to listen to something for 20 seconds and go, I don't like it. Or, even, then, or even five seconds. Yes. I, and then I, just start listening to something else. But, or, this, but, but, but it was okay. We could just say it's, it was different. Mm. Now, whether it was any better or not, I'm not going to suggest that. Yeah. For us, it was clearer mm. uh, and the same thing you know you, you get your money together over two or three weeks and you go into the shop and you buy the new Beatles album yeah. and you take it home like it's gold and you put it onto the Danset record player you know which has got one speaker about this big and you just sit back and the thing is that you know I and, and certainly Mark we still make albums which you're supposed to put on at the beginning and take off at the end I think very carefully yeah. about where the songs are in the record I don't just put them out as, you know, okay, that's, it'll go there, it'll go yeah. there. Um, so it, it's quite an old fashioned way of making music. Mm. But there's still a lot of people out there who quite like that sort of flow because it's, it's an experience for me still putting on a record yeah. from beginning to end and seeing the way somebody is moving through their songwriting and the musical playing and the, yeah. it's, a, it's a bit like doing a concert. You choose the songs very, very carefully yeah how you make that concert work. There's a sort of a slight formula, which I'm not going to go into now, but, you know, in order to keep the audience sort of, you know, energised and in in the right frame. And the the musicians, you know, because playing for two and a half hours, you get tired, funny enough. No. You know, so those are the thought processes, which when you pick something just off Spotify or the internet, oh, and we listen to it for five seconds or 20 seconds, then you go, oh, I don't like then go to something else. It's like, I'm a bit disappointed by that, really. Yeah, no, I, I, if you've just spent the last six months, 12 months <laughs> writing these, you know, 50 songs to narrow it down to 10, to put yeah. on an album, spend hours over the audio you're going to put in, and then you get 20 seconds. <laughs> Someone goes, I'm not interested. Must be slightly I, I'm, just gonna, I just remember something, actually. Yep. I was asked to go on Newsnight yep. at the last moment because there was, so, I can't remember the details, I'm probably going to get this terribly wrong, but the idea of it was... Uh, Pink Floyd were holding out for not having Dark Side of the Moon put on on the, on the internet so yep. that people could just pick the tracks off it. And I was brought on as being some kind of dinosaur <laughs> to support the idea that you should listen to it from beginning to end. And they had a point, and I think it was Kirsty Lang that was in, you know, she said, well, of course, you've come to the generation which would agree with them. That they, and I said... In a way, I do, but I'm not sure how you can stop this. This is a train that is just going to keep rolling. It ain't going to. Yeah. It ain't going to change. So, in some ways, yes, you can hold out and say you can. You have to buy the whole album, and not many people could do this apart from the yeah. Floyd, of course. Yeah. Or you don't get any tracks at all. Yeah. Uh, do you remember that moment? I do. All right. Yeah. And 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 I was going. I'm in two minds about this. Yes, of course. I'm. I love the beginning to end thing of that record. Yeah. I can't play it in the middle. It seems pointless. But some people I, might just want to listen to money and that's it. You pick that off. I want to listen to that song. I, I sometimes feel that it's an easy negotiating position when you've made all the money already. You know, it's easy for Pink Floyd <laughs> nice to, to go. Nice you to know, <laughs> it's easy for Pink Floyd to go, we'll decide how you listen to our music because we're all multimillionaires anyway and it doesn't really matter. I, can't, I do... I do think there's a point now that you're right. It is I think a, train. a little disingenuous. I think they were trying to uh, protect their art. I, 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 but if if let's say we wrote an album today, you know, and 
we can have and, a go. But. Yeah, and 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 we decided that we wouldn't, we weren't going to let people consume it in any way other than our own preferred way. Yeah. Uh, and then nobody did, and we wouldn't have any money, you know. And you go, oh, well, so I, I, I didn't look. I'm a huge Pink Floyd fan, and I, and I certainly didn't. I just think it's, it's, it's. I think it's it's easier to have a point of view about how music is consumed and how perhaps that affects the artist commercially or or artistically if it doesn't really matter whether anyone agrees with you or not because you're all extremely wealthy anyway and I, I you know you you sort of I, anyway okay well all I would We're, say is that <laughs> as as musicians you're very fortunate to to make any money at all yes right uh, obviously, we can't really talk about that because obviously the Straits have done very well, the Floyd did very well, and all the rest of it. But the fact of the matter is, it's what actually motivates you to still get out of bed in the morning, and what what you enjoy doing with yeah. the time you have. You yeah. know, whether you whether you buy a yacht and go sailing around the Caribbean, or whether you go into the studio and hammer out some ideas. Or as I talked said to you earlier, you know, I, I pick up all those bits on the iPhone and somehow make an album out of it all. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, you if if you don't want to do that, then you don't do it, and you go and spend your money and enjoy it and all the rest of it. But I think vast majority of the people you're talking about are still pretty much actively yeah. sort of creating, and I don't think you you just can't stop doing that. It's just kind of in your blood, and you it's impossible to to move into anything other than that. You know. And you mentioned, like, you know, owning pubs. I've got one pub, by the way. And I thought you'd had more than one over the oh, years. Oh, I did. I did. That was a mistake. So. But anyway, See, he's so. much more entre- entrepreneurial than he's... Well, no, actually, I just wanted to do something different for a while. But anyway, that's <laughs> so we won't go into that. Um, uh, as we know, there's no money in hospitality. Um, uh, <laughs> that's the reality of hospitality. Um, so, I mean, I think, you, you, you know, you've... You, You've really got to want to do this because, as we spoke earlier, not everybody can make a living out of it. Yeah. A, a terrible fresh expression, but you never enter it. You know, when I first started playing the guitar, I didn't think, oh, my God, you know, I can't wait to, you know, make some money out of this. It was like, I just had to do it. Yeah. And, um, you know, when you get your, your, your first gig money in, I'd be at 20 quid and it's cost you 15 quid to do it. You still go, OK, so we made a fiver. Yeah. You know, and... You know, you can go down the local chip we, and get some food. We probably should try and segue this. We, we started off really, really well following the, so what was it that got you into music? And then we just segued <laughs> off somewhere completely. So I want to go As back you do. to... Now, I, I suspected this was the case, but it was... So you, you were a regular six-string guitar player, first and foremost. Yeah. But, but basically the opportunity to get gigging was to learn the instrument with four strings on it well yeah i mean yes i mean i was i was just i was just des- desperate to join a band and, and my brother was already in it and he was a you know a rudimentary guitar player yeah there were two guitar players in the band and a drummer and somebody who played a bit of piano and i said i want to join and i strummed a few chords and the rest of it they said no we don't want any more guitar players if you want to join you know um then you'll have to play the bass and i went okay i'll play the bass thinking Okay, what's that about? And my brother, God bless him, was very good at woodwork. Right. And he made me a bass. Wow. In the woodwork shop at school, yeah. Touch of the Brian May about that then, is there? Sort of your first bass was It didn't look like a Brian May guitar. (laughs) It it was called the spade for a particular reason. You could have dug a garden with it. Anyway, he managed to get all the frets in the right place, amazingly. Brilliant. And he bought a pickup off the internet. not the internet. No, I was going to say, yeah. that would have been an incredible feat back in 1960-something or other. It's because you were telling me earlier yes, about but out your of a business. catalogue or something. Out of a catalogue. Yeah. Of a catalogue. And we built all our speakers, you know, in the woodwork shop and put the, put the whole thing together for virtually nothing. Brilliant. And he built me my first guitar. I have no idea where it went. But anyway, that was... So I, I, I just listened to the tracks that were going on at the time yeah. and, and just... So what know. influenced your... I mean, I, you quite modest when we were talking about um, we were talking about how you sort of fitted into the Dire Straits thing and 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 the the way you played bass and that you, you know you sort of accepted that you were keeping it more simple, you know. Yeah, to, yeah. To, to, so how does Still that? Still do. 
yeah, how does that sort of, um, you know, so what, what bass players were sort of influencing you or did, was it, or was it even a different journey for you? Was it, was it actually, you know, you were just there in the moment doing what you thought was right or was, you know, was there a, were you avidly listening to the bass lines on other tracks and thinking, oh yeah, I like that, I'll try and put that sort of style well, I, in? I, I'd, I'd played with a lot of different bands before, uh, before The Straits soul bands and I even, you know, rock and roll, uh, blues bands and such like that. So I, I had the rudiments of, you know, playing a few different mm -hmm. styles. But when I started playing with Mark, it, 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 it just became really obvious to me what I needed to do. And which was, because he was, you know, when you're playing like that, that mm. picking sort of guitar, it's quite complicated. So you don't want to be playing all over that. Yeah or else it just gets messy. Yeah. So I just sort of, I just, I just got that, and, you know, and, 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 and it's been like that ever since really. So I keep it very simple um, and just do kind of what's necessary. And I've, I, in, a, in a way that it respects the song, whatever the yeah. song is, yeah. you know. Uh, and it's, it's not because I, you know, I don't, I, that's just the way that I play now. I can't, I can't really explain it any more than that. And I don't worry about that. So even on this new album I've just done, uh, eight. I mean, it's it's the it's the same thing. It's just it's very simple. Yeah. And people say, oh my God, that sounds like a bit sort of straightsy. And I'm going, but what do you? I mean, <laughs> what? Do you, I mean, it's in what? What do you expect? I'm really sorry, but that's the way I play. You know. Yeah. And do you, do you think that in? You know, I know Mark gets a lot of the credit, obviously, for you know the song, the, the you know the songs and the, the riffs and stuff like that. But what was the was there a? I can think, you know, there's quite a few Straitsy songs where they are a little bit, you know, this they're more sort of ambient chord driven rather than necessarily a sort of a a, a, a picked obvious kind of lead line or riff, if you like. Oh, yeah, so when yeah. when, yeah. when you were writing those, what what's your What's your sort of role in the final? How does it come together? Oh God, you're talking about band dynamics now, which are really complicated. Are uh, they? I mean, I, well, I, well they, they'll be the different for different people, won't they? Yes. Um, I think the way that I would put it is you need to know what you think you can offer the situation. And, you know, when you when you're in the presence of somebody who's writing songs like Romeo and Juliet mm. and, and uh, you know, Sultans of Swing and, and Tunnel of Love, you respect the fact that, you know, somebody is on a, on, a, on, a, on a line which not many people are on. And so you think, OK, I, can, I, can, I know what to do with this. I know, I know my place in this. I know my place. I know my place in this situation. I know what I can offer to it. And I know I can do it well. And so... That's really the dynamic of when, when the songs were brought to the band. A lot of the time, some of them were quite finished, mm -hmm. but, but it, there were a number of occasions when they weren't. And some, some didn't appear. I don't know what, where they've gone. <laughs> uh, they didn't work, it didn't work out. So if it didn't work out with the first everybody joining in, Mark would say, OK, I've got something else. So we'd, you know, and so we'd work on things together. Um, and he was very, you know, uh, easy to, about it. You know, mm. it wasn't kind of, we're doing this whether you like it or not. So there was, there was an none of that. He wasn't an kind of band leader. He never, have been, never has been like that. And uh, so as a consequence, people were able to uh, uh, contribute uh, mm. what was necessary. And, it, and the thing is, with a good song, it's obvious what you need to do. I mean, for instance, with Romeo and Juliet, it's five chords. I think it's five chords. I mean, one, two, three, four. It's five chords, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks, I can't remember. I was, uh, yeah, so what can you do with five chords? You can write the most beautiful song with five chords. And so don't mess with it. So yeah. if you listen to the bass part on that, it's, it's literally, it's probably maybe eight notes, maybe, maybe nine. That's all it needed. Didn't yeah. need any more than that. Yeah. You know, and so... I think this is where sometimes people get lost thinking, oh, I'm going to make, I'm going to leave my mark on this, you know, but it wasn't necessary. And I think that was the 
to me, that was the beauty of the way that the relationship worked over all those years was the fact that you kind of knew what was necessary. Mm. And um, if you were going to have a debate about that, then it wasn't going to work. Right. So as soon as there was a sense that maybe there yeah. was some tension around how something might be put together, it was almost just like, OK, we'll just move on. We'll find the next yes, song. Yes. And, and I learned a lot from that, mm. I have to say, because uh, I learned a lot about how to approach writing a song. And I, my first solo album came out in... I'm going to push my first solo no, album. No, do. No. Anyway, <laughs> my, but, I, but I, you know, when we had a break after um, Love Over Gold, we had a, we, actually we, we had about six months to nine months off, which was mm -hmm. amazing because we had been literally five years of not complete nonsense. And um, so, I, you know, I, d I did Love Over Gold, uh, never, never Told a Soul. And, you know, working in the band frame, I, I learned a lot about songwriting and how to put it together. And that still stays with me now, how to approach the writing mm. of a song. You know. When you talk about that five years of nonsense, <laughs> I mean, it, it shouldn't be nonsense, really. It's crazy. No, I, 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 it think, was I pretty, think it's actually it was a wonderful crazy. way of, of, it was crazy. of saying yeah, it. it was Where, I mean, I, I kind of feel that the 80s got a bit of a bad press during the 90s for the kind of music that came out. And I'm not talking about necessarily bands like Dire Straits, but I'm probably talking about, you know, the sort of the, 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 the more Duran Duran, Spandau, pop, you know, that sort of... And, it, and actually, I think in the last 10 years, I look back and I go, I actually think maybe the 80s was the last year of the supergroup, the mega album, the, not the last year, the last decade, sorry. Mm. And I can put on you know, um, Brothers in Arms or, or, uh, or, or uh, No Jacket Required, you know, or, mm. or, or So by Peter Gabriel, probably still my sort of go-to, is yeah. there a finer produced album ever? Yeah. I'm not sure. You know, and you just go, has anything topped that since? And, and is it just the fact that record companies just went, just not going to give you the time and the money to do that anymore? You know, you've got to churn it out a bit faster. Or, or am I just stuck in some nostalgic teenage years of mine going, that was my little bit where I liked it better than anything else, you know? And well, it's probably a combination <laughs> of all those factors. So uh, what, tell just... me about the nonsense, because I kind of just think it did seem like things were just bigger then than they have been subsequently? Well, uh, I, I mean, I know this sounds odd, but I'm always, I, I was always a bit, a bit taken by surprise by what happened. Right. Um, uh, it, we, had to, we had to learn a lot very quickly uh, when that first album came out and it got big in the States. Uh, you know, you, you, you're, you, it's unexpected what happens. Mm. And suddenly there's an awful lot of attention and there's a lot of, and then so there is tension in the band because you, you know, you're trying to make this thing work. And we were literally working non-stop, touring. If we weren't touring, we were recording. If we weren't recording, we were rehearsing. And so that was really, that was life. There wasn't anything else going on, which of course, you know, made it difficult to have any family life at all. And of course, quite a few of the families kind of suffered as a consequence. Um, but, you know, the, the, it was an incredibly exciting time. Uh, and I think about it now, and one of, re one of the reasons why um, I wrote the book, uh, you know, which came out last year, was that I wanted to try and understand for myself, because it's 30 years since the band stopped, you know, 1992. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it's now our 30 year of stopping anniversary. Yep. Um, and I just wanted to, in a sense, understand what really that was all about because after 30 years you kind of it's it's a distant memory it, it, you're constantly reminded of it because mm -hmm. there's music's being played and the rock and roll hall of fame and all that kind of stuff and and it was a, a, a apart from being a very cathartic thing it was to me it was a celebration of understanding a what we'd achieved and b what an incredible experience it was to be involved in that story mm. You know, which is the dire straight story. I won't call it journey because I hate the word journey. 
I've never quite understood it. I think journey is when you drive to Cornwall, <laughs> you know. Uh, but this story, as it unfolded, very quickly and very intensely was um, remarkable. And of course, when you're in it, it becomes a bit normal to say, oh, we're going to go and play in Turin next week and we're going to play in Rome next week and there's going to be 100,000 people there and 50,000 people there and you've just sold 10 million records and you, you know, your bank account's going like this and you go, and you go and buy a VW Golf and you feel guilty, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, it, and it's, it's, it's a bit crazy, the whole thing's a bit crazy, but the thing that actually held it together was the fact that we, A, we loved working together, particularly Mark and I, and the songs were so um, incredible, really. Mm. And I wanted, he was, he was never going to shout about himself, so I thought, I've got the opportunity, because I've known him for a long time. Yeah. It's my opportunity to actually say, kind of thank you, you know, from everybody mm. involved in that story. And that's the truck drivers, the caterers, the crew, you know, God knows who else was involved in that. And the, all the musicians, different musicians were involved. And um, it, was a, it was a really important thing for me to do. I, I was reluctant to do it because I thought, God, how the hell am I going to... But then lock, lockdown comes along. Mm. Perfect opportunity. And uh, so I think the fact that the music was so good, you know... And, so, and, and still is now. Mm. I mean, you know, I went to this literary festival in, in, uh, in Ireland last week, last weekend, and um, played Brothers in Arms with a mm. guitar player from Hothouse Flowers in front of uh, a load of people who just heard all these war correspondents talking about all the stuff that's going on in Ukraine. And they said, will you come and play Brothers in Arms? And... Mm. And uh, I'm thinking about it now. I, mean, I felt very emotional doing it. it. I, uh, but, I mean, that song, you see, is, yeah. is if somebody held a gun to my head, which I hope they never do, yeah. I would say that is the one song that will... It'll be around forever. Absolutely forever. It's, so, you, you know, you, that's I've, the point I'm making. It's about the song. It's about the music. Mm -hmm. It's not really about anything else. The, yeah. the other trappings are fantastic. But that, for me, was the... The joy, mm. if you like. Do you, do you think that's been... I've got to say as well, it's... Brothers in Arms is... You can't even talk about Brothers in Arms, Brothers in Arms, without welling... I can't, anyway. Just like, but without it evoking... And when I listen to the words of the song, they don't... It, you know, I don't... It doesn't make me go, oh, yeah, I, I don't share an experience in the sense of, like, it's not a story about me, you know, mm. or a, a, an experience happened to me. Mm. But it's so everything, the, the, what he's singing about and, the, and the, the, just the chord structure and his, mm. the swells that he does mm. on the notes he comes through. I mean, I, it's, it's interesting you say that, isn't it? Because I, for me, if I had to say what's the, what's the Dire Straits song that I would hope is still being played in 100 years' time, that would be the song I would yeah. choose. It may not be, you know, it probably wasn't, well, not even probably, it, it, if you had to probably, you know, if you did your straw poll of 100 people in the street, name me five Dire Straits songs, half of me thinks this, you know, it's probably in, it, it probably wouldn't be number one. I suppose Money for Nothing is going to be the one everyone else. Well, Walk of Life, Money for Nothing. Life, yeah. Yeah, well, but I mean, if you, Walk of Life's a pop song, basically. Yeah, you know? but if you want gets... that, you know, if you, what was that song that, you know, that you just went, wow, that's just, that's a work of genius and it's so good on every single level, mm. for me anyway. It's, it's, it's well, you see, I mean, this is, this is why we're involved in this game is really mm. for moments like that. And, mm. you know, I make no excuses for... Uh, my part on it. What do you, I mean, I've got to ask you, because I don't think I'll ever have the opportunity to ask. So, as you're cutting that record, is there, is there that hush in the studio and everyone just goes, bloody hell, that's a good song, isn't it? Or just like, you know, is it, is it mad? Or in the context of everything else, do you not realise that until, you know, a year after the album's been out and people's... No, I, I think uh, with that particular one, I think everybody realised that was a... 
that was a seminal moment, yeah. I think. Yeah. And um, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, my involvement in all that is, is, uh, is a great privilege. Mm. I, I felt very privileged, privileged to be involved in it and I still do. Well, I think that's a that that's how you you know you you still do. You you walk the line, I think, between somebody that has you know you don't get inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame unless you've been unbelievably <laughs> successful. But you still walk the line with this great modesty and 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 sort of I don't know. Other people will know you much better than I do. I've not met you for, for long, but that that's that's the kind of person that you come across as. But I did. We were talking at lunchtime, so. I can't, but it's 30 years since the last official Dire Straits, which is nuts, right? Um, but you've still kept on writing. Uh, you've yeah, got yeah. a catalogue of your own albums. Um, yeah. I spent this morning listening to eight, and it's a, you know, you can, you can tell that, you know, it's a, there's, a, there's a Dire Straits vibe to it like that, not in a rip-off kind of way, but just in a, a the, the vibe, you know, of it is, mm -hmm. has got that feeling. There's some amazing musicians on there, but I was interested in it's like, what is it that keeps you wanting to write what is basically an album every couple of years? Um, well, it's a very good question. I mean, I, I, I could answer it simply by saying I've got nothing else to do, but, I, but, <laughs> well, but in that fact, may well be a part of it. You know, it's like, could yeah. be better than doing the gardening, I suppose, isn't it? So well, I like doing that from time to time. But the, th <laughs> the thing is that, you know, I, I don't quite know. And I, and I said to you, as I said to you over, over lunch that um, it, it's intriguing how songs come together mm. um, and everybody does it differently, I know. Um, I believe Paul Simon always writes the, uh, the music before he writes the lyrics. Yeah. I learned that the other day at this literary festival because uh, somebody I knew had been talking to him about that. And uh, for me, it's like a massive jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll get up in the morning and have a, have a cup of tea and I'll have an idea in my mind of a title or a line and I'll write it down. So I've got books full of nonsense, basically, yeah. that doesn't make any sense. And then as the book gets developed, the songs sort of start to form and things get crossed out and then you, you know, you end up with this thing at the end. And, and I tootle around on this every now and again and so that's full of stuff. Uh, and somehow or other this jigsaw puzzle gets put together. The pieces start to fit and I still don't know how that happens. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's, it's slightly magical. Obviously it's me that's doing it, but I'm doing it on my own, whereas, you know, when we had the band together, of course, it was a different kind of thing. You know, Mark would come with an idea. He'd always have the lyrics. But he'd okay. Always have the lyrics, but he'd come with, you know, uh, sometimes a rough idea about something or other. And, uh, you know, and we'd, then we'd all knock it about, you know, but I don't have that, you know. But occasionally when I go into the studio with my guys and we play it, you know, I pick up the acoustic guitar and it goes like this, strum a few chords and they join in. I always have the tape machine running yeah. because I know somebody's first impressions of that, they'll play something that just is inspirational and yeah. you always have that bit. Nine times out of ten it's on the album. Can, pop, pop the, let's have a look at your acoustic guitar. And I almost feel like I'd... Wait, have we got another one here somewhere? So we've grabbed some guitars and for no reason other than I'm sort of fascinated. Again, you... you Every songwriter, I think, approaches things differently, you know, from Elton John at one end of the scale, who's, you know, someone else who's writing the words and he's writing the music. And as you say, some people come lyrically led, some people look for riffs and stuff and then find the lyrics. But tell, you, you, you said you just, you play around and you've got a guitar or you might sit at a piano or whatever and just play around. And then you've got a notebook, notebook with yeah. abstract sort of, you know, thoughts and lyrics in there and stuff. So what was, you know, what was the last time you were, the last time you wrote something, you know, again, what, what's, what does it look like? I mean, you, you, you were noodling around there. I don't know how much we've captured, but it's fun, fun to see you playing, you know, some Dire straight stuff, but what, what are well, you? Well, okay. I mean, I was, I, okay, this is, a, this is an example. I was trying to uh, reflect on um, the time when the band first went to America and we played at the Roxy and we were staying in the Sunset Marquee and that was a very exciting time for us. Um, and so I started writing this song and it's called Long Way Back. And mm -hmm. it's, you, you, it's listen to the album. It's right. really, it's a long way back to Deptford Town, right? Uh, which of course is where the band started in a council flat in Deptford. 
So it had to have that Dire Straits feel. Are you a, I'm, again, even the strumming pattern has a, in fact, it's probably more the strumming pattern than the chord structure there that's reminding me of a sort of a Dire Straits kind of vibe. Well, that's you... the idea. These, these, these are basically chords from um, Tunnel of Love and yeah. Songs of Swing, you know. City of angels was burning bright, setting the scene for an early night, standing on the edge of tranquility. This was the moment to take in the view, shimmering with the red and the blue, sun going down, the sunset marquee. So it's that kind of thing, you know, and that's just the, the, the Dire Straits feel. And everybody yeah. says, oh, that's a Dire Straits song. Well, it's not actually, but it's very reflective of yeah. that time. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so, I don't know, it just came out of, came out of all that sort of just thinking about those old days, really, you know. And, and again, lyrically, is that something that is, is that the hardest part that you find to try and come up with meaningful lyrics or is it sort of, does it, <laughs> I mean, I'm the world's worst lyricist in the sense of every attempt I've ever done is just like, it's all, I can't ever seem to write about anything that doesn't sound just cheesy and awful. But I mean, even just listening to that, you sit there going, it was a perfectly, you know, interesting... The original version wasn't like that. It was very different from that. It does take, it takes time. I mean, sometimes you get the, the, the thing right. I mean, you know, when I wrote a song for, uh, uh, you know, my, my wife, Stephanie, I was, I was, you know, trying to think of um, how to, you know, write a love song, really. So I thought, well, I'll go back to the time when I met her, which was yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Love You Still on the record, which right. is basically sort of... Because that's got the slide guitar on. Right. I was out on a limb, I did not know. Next to me, you began to glow. The rain was hard. Didn't bother me. So that's just, you know, that's sort of just... Yeah. And so... And that, sounds that seemed to suit the... You more know, reminiscent of maybe the songs that you grew up listening to, you know, just like... Yeah, kind of, but, kind of. you know, I wanted to write something which wasn't kind of... You know, you don't write a rock and roll song about the fact you love your wife, you know. It's got to be more kind of... A bit more <laughs> like that. Now, you... You're, the, la the latest album, you had some... Actually, you've worked with Robbie Mack... Uh, quite a lot. For, for quite a lot, haven't oh, you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, t Robbie's probably one of the UK's finest guitar players that, you know, we've ever produced and has played with lots, lots of musicians over the years and a smashing guy as well. Um, and, uh, and we shouldn't not mention as well, I, I, apologies for honing in on the guitar players, but that's, they're, the, they're the only ones that I'll recognise. Well, we're only guitar um, shop. Yeah, uh, but <laughs> Scott, Scott McKeown is on the... Had you worked with Scott before eight? Mm -hmm. or? You had as well. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. now you said you like to play the first... You like, the, you like to have the tape machine running and to see what the music, how they react to the first. Yeah. What do you, what do you like? I mean, this is going to be, you know, uh, Ro Robbie and Scott, if you know, we'll, we'll probably say lovely things about you now. So if you get embarrassed, you can go and make a <laughs> cup of tea now. But what is it that, what do they, what do they bring? What do you love about, you know, how they embellish some, an idea that you might already have had? I just think they, they just have incredible imagination. Mm. And uh, well, talent, obviously, but um, uh, I think because they've played with lots of different people and different styles. Although Scott, as you know, is more of a, a, a more of a blues player. Mm. Uh, Robbie has a, a, a extraordinary breadth of um, uh, musical kind of uh, uh, knowledge, uh, and as Scott does. But Scott prefers the more earthy mm -hmm. kind of playing. And it just so happened on this record, uh, you know, Scott was more available than Robbie was because Robbie was undergoing something. And, um, and so you know, this is not naturally Scott's department, these mm -hmm. kind of songs, you know, but the one song on there, which the, the playing on it is, is amazing, the song called Wondering, mm -hmm. which is just... 
just a dead simple chord. And his playing on it is just so beautiful. And um, so, I don't know, you know, some things work and some things don't, essentially. And he had, he had the ability on this record to do things, apart from incredibly quickly, was with, with uh, complete originality. Mm -hmm. And it really surprised me, actually, because, as I say, he's more of a blues player, but um, if anybody wants to listen to that album, they should listen to the guitar playing on it, because it is fantastic. It's a really good, you know, I wasn't, genuinely wasn't sure what to expect when I started whizzing through, you know, your, you know, it's quite a big body of work since you left, uh, or since you stopped doing the Dire Straits thing. And um, yeah, it's, it's uh, I'm, and I mean this as a, as a compliment, it doesn't sound like music that someone is, uh, right, how am I trying to sort of put this? I think there's a, I think <laughs> once someone, you like. <laughs> no, 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 well, I think once someone has had big success in a band, it's not uncommon to just go away and make some quite self-indulgent music that's just for them and not for anybody else. Just, and it didn't feel like that. I mean, it was all very listenable to, you know, it was like, I, I, di I didn't, you know, well, thank it does, you. doesn't go, it doesn't go sort of crazy off piste and, you know, it's not like sort of John's Django Reinhardt tribute thing because you liked him or something. It's, it's just, it's really nice. And I almost, in a way, I, I was listening to this sort of going, yeah, it's just kind of a shame maybe that some of this music doesn't get a bit more airplay than maybe it probably, you know, I guess you've probably got to go and try and find it, haven't you, to sort of listen to Well, to I, stuff I, I, well I've been pleasantly surprised by this record, actually, because mm. it has got um, a, quite a bit of more attention, which has drawn people back to the other albums and, you know, oh, didn't know you, oh, oh, really? And, you know, in a quiet way, people would get there in the end. And I'm, you know, although we've got all the social media stuff that um you know uh, we can use uh, yeah. in some ways you have to discover this stuff for yourself i think you know when you when you uh, when you when if you're interested in music i don't i don't, don't quite know how it works but uh somehow or other this is, this this album's getting out better than the other ones is Right. It's, it, which is which is which is very satisfying. Perhaps it's because you've embraced social media a bit, done videos and yeah, we've done we do yeah we've done some videos and I think that's yeah, all of it helps. I mean I think it's absolutely well, but you, you can't ignore it now, yeah. and I and I, I I think it's probably an but it is an integral part of actually doing anything now in a creative uh, environment. You know, yeah. like putting the book out, or doing a record. You know, a few paintings are put on the internet and stuff like that. It's all it, it's a great communication tool, and and if it's used if it's used properly, I mean, obviously it gets does get abused. We know that, but <laughs> don't try not to think about that too much. Um, but I think that you know, we, you either embrace it and say yes, let's use it, because uh, it's the only in in some ways in in reality, it's the only way of getting that stuff out there is by is by using this 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 this. Extraordinary. I mean, the internet to me is amazing because I get stuff from all over the world. People coming onto the site and saying, you know, there's a 17 year old from China or something. Yeah. I've just discovered something to swing. It's like, <laughs> you know, and I think it's wonderful. I mean, yeah, because that would never ever have, or it would have been nigh on impossible for something like that to have happened, you know. It, it, 40 years ago, you know. So, no, um, no, and, 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 that, and, and that, in a sense, we, you have to, we have to be aware of the fact that music is the most incredible communication mm. tool, if you like, for the world. And this country is still recognised as being a pretty major part of new ideas and new music, mm. uh, probably more than any other country uh, in in, in, in spreading some new and also old music around the world. And that really, there's a lot of things that separate the world apart, as we know. Uh, yeah. And music, to me, is a, is a big unifying factor. Uh, and I think that because the Straits had sort of global connections, um, that's what was amazing to me, mm. was how many different people are getting it. So even if they don't understand the language, they're still getting it, you know, in Greece, in yeah. Turkey, in yeah. China, in the Philippines. We said that over lunch, and we music is this 
you know, whether you go back to just percussive, rhythmic, bit of dancing around the fire sort of stuff, or you take it up to some of the most, you know, complicated pieces of orchestral music ever, you know, there's, yeah. there's something, I don't know, it just emotes something. Well, it, it makes people feel mm. something, something, which is mm. different from conversation, it's different mm. from looking at a painting. Mm. The combination of words and music uh, is incredible. Um, just music on its own, you know, yeah. you listen to Mozart, listen to Beethoven, you listen to, you know, Brahms or whatever, you know, it's fantastic. You know, one of my favourite things is Strauss's Four Songs with Jesse Norman. I put that on the studio when I'm painting and I mean, my paintings just change because it just lifts me whew, straight up. You know, so I think it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic um, uh, unifier and also uh, emotional Sort of, sort of calming influence as well. Mm -hmm. Leaving heavy metal out of it, of course. Or I like it. That, 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 no, uh, yeah, that's emotive as well. Just I maybe know, not I necessarily know. the sort of emotion you want at half past seven. Especially in, the in Germany. Yes. Yeah, there's a big, big deal in um, Germany. Yeah. Well, come on. So, what is. I feel like we've picked guitars out. Like I've picked a guitar for no reason. Okay, well, I'll um, tell you what. Why don't we play Songs of Swing and you. And, because that's never going to happen, basically. Why not? I don't care what you do. I played it with this guy from Hot House Flowers the other day, and he just played a few. It was fantastic. Crikey. All you know right, the then course. You know the, you, have, you might have to remind me. So, well, it's just, it's just D minor. C. B flat, A. And then the, then the F. C, B flat, where are we going back to the beginning? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you ready for this? Bit of subtle editing coming up. <laughs> are we saying? You get a shiver in the dark, it's raining. The park. Right, sorry, that's my fault. No, it's alright, I was probably. I'm. Go on, it, 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 it doesn't matter if this takes a couple of times to go around, he says. With pra this is a practice run. You get a shiver in the park, it's raining. Get a shiver in the dark, it's raining in the park, the meantime. Fell off the river, you stop, you hold everything, eh? This is the F. Band is blowing Dixie. C. Double four time. B flat. You feel alright. You hear that music ring. C. Uh. D minor. Step inside. You don't see too many faces. Come in the rain to hear the jazz go down. F. Competition in other C. <laughs> B flat. Yes, and the holes are blowing that sound. C. One down south, B flat C. Way on down south in London town. Oh. Do now, you know what? Now I'm it up. We'll make a bit of that. I, I feel like. I'm trying to think of the. I'm trying to think of the solo. Uh, really, solo. solo. Yeah, it's what I'm trying to think of. Check out guitar, George. Knows all the chords. Go on. I do strictly rhythm, does make it prior. Guitar is all you can afford. Gets into the lights to do his thing. And Harry doesn't mind if he doesn't make the scene. Oh man. Do you know what? We'll, we'll have a little edited bit of that. Job and he's doing all right. I I feel like I feel like Mark will be watching this, just literally just going like, why did you do this, John? <laughs> Who is this guy that you've just buddied up with today? Anyway, anyway, I kind of feel that look, I apologize for not doing a better job. I will go away and learn some better chop chops. 
but I would like to just say, because I kind of feel like we should probably draw this to a conclusion now. Uh, <laughs> it, it has been an honest pleasure and an honor to, to have some lunch with you, spend some time talking about guitars and life and music and everything. I mean, we're, you've achieved so much, you know, musically and, you know, as, a, as an author and as a painter and just in life in general. Is there, you know, what, what else, what other mountains are there left to climb? Well, I'd like to paint better pictures. Right. To surprise me. Right. I'd like to be surprised by painting some better pictures. And I'll just continue to write music. I won't write another book because I think one book's enough. Uh, you can write novels. No, I think my wife's better at that right. than me. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't realise it yet, but she is. Um, and, you know, just, uh, just enjoy... I enjoyed the success of the band and I enjoy, I enjoy what I'm doing now, so I don't really have any complaints at all, apart from my own frustrations about sometimes it takes me a long time to get a song together, but I get wow. there in the end. Honestly, it has been a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for coming up and thank you. shooting thank some you. video with us. Um, good luck with everything in the future. Not thank that you, you need it, but yes, please look. Go check out uh, all of it, really. If, you, you know, if you're a Dire Straits fan and you've not listened to John's music, go and do that. Obviously, the book links will be below where you can find out how to buy the book. Um, you do the show, don't you? A little sort of like a um, conversational yeah. piece about. So if, yeah. if, if John comes through your town at some point in the future doing that show, go and see that. But look, uh, it's been a pleasure. And if somebody needs a drink and they're in the New Forest, what's the best pub there that they should go to? Oh, well, uh, it's the East End Arms, just outside Lymington. You heard it there. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for you. watching and we'll see you next time.